In this talk, we'll review 10 top misdiagnoses to avoid when you're reading chest x-rays on call, and realistic benchmarks for a radiologist reading chest x-rays prospectively. Let's start off with overlooking a retained foreign body. Take a look at this chest x-ray for a few seconds and see if you can spot the foreign body. The foreign body is a suture needle in the left chest wall. In a study published in 2003, researchers found that while suture needles 19 millimeters and longer could be identified by all observers on x-ray, no one could spot suture needles smaller than 13 millimeters. In a different 2008 study using pig cadavers, while sensitivity for spotting retained needles 10 millimeters and longer was good and inter-observer agreement was moderate, sensitivity plummeted for needles under 10 millimeters. When you're on call, you're bound to get a call from the OR because their needle counts off and they want you to try to spot a needle on an x-ray. You need to know if what they're asking you to do is realistic or not. When you get that call, always ask what the length of the suture needle or suture size is so you can set your own expectations and their expectations appropriately. If the suture needles for a 4-0 suture are thicker, you probably should be able to see it on the chest x-ray if it's there. Take a look at this chest x-ray for a few seconds and see if you can spot the foreign body. The foreign body is a retained guide wire floating in the thoracoabdominal aorta. Here's an example of a guide wire coursing through the right internal jugular vein, right brachiocephalic vein, SVC, right atrium, and IVC in a different patient. Retained guide wires tend to be associated with urgent line insertion procedures, particularly when a second line kit had to be opened. On call, you're bound to see tons of films with overlying cardiac monitoring leads. Don't gestalt leads and wires. Always carefully inspect the course of each and every one you see, and be particularly vigilant on chest x-rays obtained in trauma patients or during or right after a code. Take a look at this chest x-ray for a few seconds and see if you can spot the foreign body. It's not the endoscope. The foreign body is a retained surgical sponge in the patient's mediastinum. Now take a look at this chest x-ray and see if you can spot the foreign body. The foreign body is a, also a retained surgical sponge, but this one is in the left upper quadrant abdomen just below the diaphragm. Surgeons use two kinds of sponges in the operating room. Ratex sponges and standard lap pads. Ratex are four by eight inch, inch pieces of gauze that have a very thin blue radiopaque string woven through them that appear on x-ray as a very thin long squiggle when inside a patient. Lap pads are four by four inch folded cloth pads that can unfold into a bigger pad and have a blue radiopaque tag sewn in the corner. On x-ray, the tag may appear scrunched up when inside a patient. Take a look at this chest x-ray and see if you can spot the foreign body. The foreign body is an aspirated molar in the bronchus intermedius that was probably dislodged during intubation. Retained dental objects can happen in facial trauma patients or folks who were emergently intubated. When you're on call, a disciplined approach to individually reviewing and understanding the provenance of each radiopaque object you see is your best way to avoid overlooking a retained dental object or any other foreign body. If you're being asked to look for something in particular, but don't know what it might look like on x-ray, don't hesitate to ask for a radiograph of an identical item so you'll know what to actually look for. You might be surprised how often we do that. Inaccurately assessing lines and tubes is another diagnostic error folks may be worried about making when reading chest x-rays on call. Since you've got a bit of experience reading chest x-rays now, we expect you should be pretty comfortable catching most malpositioned endotracheal and enteric tubes. But how about this patient? 
The course of the left neck approach catheter should strike us as unusual, since it's still left of midline as far inferior as the tracheal bifurcation, which is because it's situated in the descending thoracic aorta. Let's do a brief dive into anatomy. Here's midline as defined by the trachea. If we concentrate on anatomy at or below the tracheal bifurcation and scroll to the SVC and caboatrial junction, we recognize that both travel in a vertical line completely to the right of midline. The caboatrial junction is usually around the same level as the aortic root, which is completely left of midline, as is the descending thoracic aorta. When reading a chest x-ray for central line placement, find midline using the trachea, and then find the caboatrial junction, one and a half vertebral body heights distance inferior to the carina. Catheters in this zone, at or below caboatrial junction and right of midline, will be central venous, while catheters in this zone, at or below the tracheal bifurcation and left of midline, are suspicious for intra-arterial placement. Except in the rare occasion of a patient with a left-sided SVC, which has a prevalence rate of around 0.3%, or a patient with a left-sided approach catheter and a duplicated SVC, which also has a prevalence rate of around 0.3%. Our confidence categorizing the location of short catheters that don't reach one of these two colored zones tends to be a little lower. Most folks use the trachea instead of the spine as their midline reference since it's closer to the SVC and aorta and therefore a little less susceptible to parallax than, say, the spine. In older patients who tend to have more tortuous arterial anatomy, the tortuosity or absence of tortuosity of the catheter's course might sometimes provide an additional clue. And remember to be cautious when approaching chest x-rays with obliquely positioned patients, since midline can be tough to place on those images. Take a look at this chest x-ray and see if you can spot what's wrong. A right-sided chest tube is present, but its side hole is in the chest wall, and even though the distal segment overlies the lung, its horizontal course is highly suggestive for a path in the anterior chest wall superficial to the rib cage rather than inside the rib cage. Always make sure that the tip and side hole of a chest tube appear to be in the pleural space. Chest tubes that take a horizontal path tend to be associated with a higher likelihood that the tube is in the chest wall outside of the rib cage. And if you see secondary signs of ineffective chest tube drainage, such as a persistent pneumothorax, persistent pleural fluid, or increasing subcutaneous emphysema, double check that the chest tube or tubes are okay. Take a look at this chest x-ray and see if you can spot what's wrong. In this patient, there is an inferior pointing right atrial cardiac conduction lead because it had become dislodged, which was a noticeable change when compared to the patient's prior chest x-ray. When you encounter a pacemaker or ICD on call, always take a few seconds to compare it to a prior chest x-ray if one's available. If you happen to know what type it is from the indication or the patient's record, Try to make sure the type matches what you see. Be familiar with the expected positions of transvenous cardiac conduction leads. Right atrial lead tips are usually placed in the right atrial appendage, while right ventricular lead tips are usually placed in the right ventricular apex or along the interventricular septum. Left ventricular lead tips are usually placed in a coronary sinus tributary, and therefore appear along the posterolateral cardiac surface. And don't forget to keep an eye out for looped or kinked cardiac conduction leads. Misinterpreting pneumothoraces is the next important diagnostic error to avoid when reading chest x-rays on call. The pneumothoraces most likely to be overlooked on call are often the ones in supine patients, which tend to accumulate 
in the anterior part of the hemithorax rather than rising to the apex. In a supine patient with suspected pneumothorax, we therefore need to carefully inspect the anterior and medial regions of the lower hemithoraces. With larger pneumothoraces in supine patients, we should also be on the lookout for air in the lateral costodiaphragmatic recesses and for air outlining the anterior costophrenic angle. Can you spot the pneumothorax in this patient? The pneumothorax is present on the patient's right side in the lower anteromedial right chest, the most non-dependent region of the ribcage in a supine patient. Which of these supine patients has a pneumothorax? Patient A has a right-sided pneumothorax based on a pronounced deep sulcus sign at patient A's right lateral diaphragmatic recess. Now take a look at patient B. A deep sulcus sign is actually present on the right side in patient B as well. And patient B also has a pneumothorax. So it turns out that both of these supine patients have pneumothoraces. It's always important to compare the contralateral costodiaphragmatic recesses on both sides in patients so you can catch an asymmetry that might clue you in to a less dramatic deep sulcus sign that would at least prompt you to perhaps perform a decubitus chest x-ray to investigate the possibility of a basal or pneumothorax. And if you're on a fence, don't forget how easy a decubitus chest x-ray is usually to get. Now take a look at these three supine chest x-rays. There's a pneumothorax on one of these images. Can you tell which one? The patient with a pneumothorax is patient A, who has a right-sided pneumothorax. Unlike patient B, who has only one ear soft tissue interface in the lower right chest, patient A has two. One here, and another one here. Patient A has the double diaphragm sign, which is created when air outlines both the anterior costophrenic angle and the dome of the diaphragm. When you're reading chest x-rays on call, remember that your search for pneumothoraces need to focus on both the apices and the anteromedial lower hemithoraces. And make sure you're comfortable recognizing the deep sulcus sign and how to distinguish air outlining the anterior costophrenic angle as opposed to where lung meets diaphragm dome. Changes associated with the pneumothorax in a supine patient may sometimes also be more conspicuous once they're compared to a patient's baseline image, so priors are always helpful. Missing pleural effusions are the next important diagnostic error to avoid when reading chest x-rays on call. The pleural effusions that tend to be most challenging are subpulmonic pleural effusions and pleural effusions in patients who are imaged while lying supine. Here's a patient with a subpulmonic fluid accumulation in the lower right chest. Distinguishing a subpulmonic pleural effusion from an elevated hemidiaphragm can sometimes be tricky, so let's compare this gentleman with images from a few folks with elevated hemidiaphragms. In each comparison, one, compare where the highest point of the apparent hemidiaphragm dome is at the lung base interface, and two, more importantly, how well you see posterior basal lower lobe lung markings and other abdominal anatomy inferior to the lung base interface. And here's a right subpulmonic pleural fusion in a different patient. When you're on call, and debating between a subpulmonic pleural effusion versus elevated hemidiaphragm, remember that subpulmonic pleural effusions, not only that with subpulmonic pleural effusions, not only is the apparent hemidiaphragm dome sometimes laterally displaced, but pulmonary vessels in the posterior basal lung 
below the apparent hemidiaphragm dome will be much harder to make out than on the other uninvolved side. If the issue is on the left side, an increased distance between the gastric bubble and pseudodiaphragm can also be helpful. And don't forget how easy it is to do a lateral decubitus or ultrasound on the floor. Now let's move on to pleural effusions in patients who are imaged while lying supine. Be comfortable suspecting a layering pleural effusion whenever it feels like you're viewing the lung through a thick veil or fog that partially obscures a region um, of lung detail in a very homogeneous way. Here's a couple of examples of layering pleural effusions on the right side and on the left side. Here is this patient's chest CT. This is the best way I can illustrate what you're looking for using newsprint. It's a sense that you can still make out some fine details in an involved area, but everything's being viewed through a veil or a fog. Now, there is one important caveat to be aware of when calling layering pleural effusions in a supine patient. Make sure your patient is not positioned obliquely, since oblique positioning can sometimes make one hemithorax appear homogeneously denser than the other. Besides being on the lookout for layering pleural effusions, be on the lookout for other manifestations of pleural effusions with patients in a supine position, such as a new lateral pleural band, like the one on this patient's left side. Or a new apical cap and focal fissural accumulations, which tend to appear as new mass-like elliptical opacities whose margins are smooth, convex, and well-circumscribed maybe at one side, but indistinct on the other. By the way, there's also a layering pleural effusion on this patient's left side. Misinterpreting pulmonary edema is the next important diagnostic error to avoid when reading chest x-rays on call. As you're probably aware, the performance of radiologists identifying pulmonary edema on chest x-rays is so-so, but be familiar with some of the evidence. In general, radiologist sensitivity for detecting pulmonary edema on chest x-ray is limited, and false negatives often happen. Specificity can often be pretty poor, as is interreader agreement. This isn't a terribly high bar to reach, unfortunately. So how can we handle pulmonary edema as accurately, consistently, and efficiently as possible on call? We're going to try an exercise to find out. Folks generally agree that beside non-lung findings like pleural effusions, cardiomegaly, and the presence of a dialysis catheter, there are six imaging patterns in the lung that are most predictive for pulmonary edema on chest x-ray which are easily remembered as two airspace patterns, two interstitial patterns, and two bronchovascular patterns. Of these six imaging patterns, the presence of symmetric diffuse bilateral airspace opacities is probably the most specific feature, such as in these three images. Which is why, if you remember from our chest radiology essentials talks, our diagnostic approach with diffuse consolidation is to go with cardiogenic pulmonary edema or ARDS DAD and suggests, suggest other diagnoses only after cardiogenic pulmonary edema and ARDS had been clinically excluded. The other five imaging patterns of pulmonary edema are less specific in and of themselves. Let's look at three chest x-rays with asymmetric multifocal consolidation. Try to guess which of the three are pulmonary edema and which are not. 
This was a case of alveolar hemorrhage. Now let's look at three chest x-rays with diffuse, indistinct interstitial opacities. Try to guess which are pulmonary edema and which are not. Here we go. Curly B lines are pretty specific, right? Well, let's look at three chest x-rays with curly B lines. Try to guess which are pulmonary edema and which are not. This was a case of lung infection superimposed on emphysematous lung. Now let's look at three chest x-rays with prominent lung vascular markings. Try to guess which are pulmonary edema and which are not. It turns out that this gentleman had a PET CT the same day which showed that the increased lung markings were due to multifocal bilateral lung consolidation. The CT imaging on that day looked like this, and the FTG imaging looked like this. Finally, let's look at three chest x-rays with peribronchial cuffing. Try to guess which are of pulmonary edema and which are not. This was a case of active tuberculosis. So there are two take home points from this exercise. One, there are six lung patterns that may be predictive for pulmonary edema. Two airspace patterns, two interstitial patterns, and two bronchovascular patterns. There are three non-lung findings that are also often predictive for pulmonary edema the presence of a dialysis catheter, an enlarged cardiac silhouette, bilateral pleural effusions. Symmetric diffuse bilateral airspace passages alone will usually be sufficient in and of themselves for calling pulmonary edema in most settings. Since the other eight items here are less specific, they are usually insufficient individually of themselves for calling pulmonary edema. Consider calling edema if at least three are present and equivocate if two are present. If you think you're dealing with pulmonary edema, the presence of a dialysis catheter, enlarged cardiac silhouette, pleural effusions, curly B lines, or peribronchial cuffing favor hydrostatic pulmonary edema over capillary leak pulmonary edema. And take home point two. If you notice that you were pretty accurate at guessing which of all of those previous chest x-rays were pulmonary edema and which were not, I guess however you're diagnosing pulmonary edema is already working well, and just keep on doing that. Detecting lung nodules on chest x-ray can be tough. Take this chest x-ray. Do you spot the patient's lung nodule? How about now? Here's the answer on their coronal and sagittal CT images. Here's another example, but we'll look at the patient's CT first. The nodule isn't small, and it's above the hemidiaphragm. Now here's their chest x-ray. 
even knowing exactly where to look, how likely do you think most radiologists would have called this prospectively? Here's a third example in a patient with a right upper lobe lung mass. Here's their upright chest x-ray. And here's their portable chest x-ray, where the mass practically vanishes because of the suboptimal positioning that sometimes happens with portables. So what's the teaching point? One, come to terms with the fact that chest x-rays, especially portable chest x-rays, are a mediocre way to pick up lung nodules. Be familiar with what the evidence in the literature looks like so that you can set your expectations and the expectations of referring providers appropriately. Studies have shown that a quarter of lung nodules that were visible in retrospect were missed on a prospective chest x-ray read. Even in patients with symptomatic lung cancer, the prospective miss rate isn't much better. And radiologists' ability to distinguish calcified from non-calcified lung nodules may not be as great as you might have expected, with an average AUC of 0.75 in one study, which did not appear to show any correlation with experience or subspecialty training. And the second piece of advice is, remember where your blind spots tend to be when you're searching for a lung nodule on chest x-ray. Let's move on. Chest x-rays with an indication of rule-out TB are common, and missing active tuberculosis is an important diagnostic error to avoid when reading chest x-rays on call. Well, you probably won't miss active TB cases that look like this, or this, or this. Active TB cases will come across in real life often may appear less specific and less dramatic on chest x-ray, like this case, and this case. Can you spot the finding? It's the indistinct nodular interstitial pattern in this patient's lower right lung, which corresponded with active endobronchial tuberculosis. Remember where we fit in the diagnostic pathway for tuberculosis. Patients being worked up for tuberculosis typically start with a PPD or serum quantiferon test. If the PPD or quantiferon is negative, the patient is usually declared negative for TB infection in most cases. If the PPD or quantiferon is positive, the patient may either have active TB infection or latent TB infection and a determination must be made since the treatments are usually different. The determination involves both a clinical assessment and a chest x-ray assessment at first. If the clinical assessment and the chest x-ray assessment are both negative, the patient is usually diagnosed with latent tuberculosis. If either is positive, a more definitive test is required to establish if they really do have active TB using an AFB smear, TB culture, or molecular testing. If one of these tests come back positive, a diagnosis of active tuberculosis is made, while if they come back negative, the patient will most likely be diagnosed with latent tuberculosis. Your job as the radiologist is to look at the patient's chest x-ray and flag folks who deserve a more accurate diagnostic test. Since your role is basically to serve as a screening test for patients to receive a much more expensive definitive test, test, err on the side of being sensitive over specific. When doing chest x-ray reads, issue an impression of no evidence of active TB infection if the patient's chest x-ray is normal, if there is only a clearly calcified granuloma or if upper lung fibroproductive opacities or fibrosis are present but unchanged for at least six months based on a comparison. In the presence of any other lung or pleural situation, 
dense lung opacities, faint lung opacities, um, pleural effusion, mediastinal fullness, hilar fullness, for which the chronicity is either unknown or under six months, a chest x-ray cannot reliably exclude active TB. And a more definitive test should probably be done. Failing to recognize an mediastinal abnormality is the next important diagnostic error to avoid when reading chest x-rays on call. Understand all the structures you're looking at and through when you're interpreting the cardiomediastinal silhouette on a chest x-ray. Starting with the lungs and add the spine, the tracheal bronchial air column, azagous vein, esophagus, thoracic aorta, heart, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins, SVC and IVC, rib cage, upper abdomen, shoulder bones, and finally, the mediastinal fat and chest wall. If your interpretation of the cardiomediastinal shadow on a chest x-ray is overly focused on only the mediastinal contours and mediastinal widening, like mine was when I was first starting out as a resident, you'll be limiting yourself only to large disorders close enough to the edge of the cardiomediastinal silhouette to cause an unusual bulge, a focal disruption of the normal contour, or severe enough to cause conspicuous mediastinal widening. If you happen to be fortunate enough to have a baseline chest x-ray to compare to, you might just might sometimes get a chance to catch a slightly less conspicuous abnormality that happens to be close enough to the edge of the cardiomediastinal silhouette to result in a contour change. If the quality of both chest x-rays is good and the patient was patient uh, was patient was positioned similarly in both x-rays. But there's a lot more you can catch if you remember to take advantage of the fact that you're looking not at a cardiomediastinal silhouette, but at a cardiomediastinal shadowgram through which the spine is usually visible, the pulmonary vessels are visible, and the tracheal air column is visible too. Plus, you've got a few anatomic lines and stripes, such as the right paratracheal stripe created by right upper lobe air and tracheal lumen air outlining the right tracheal wall. The subtle azagosophageal recess created by air in the medial right lung abutting middle mediastinum near the esophagus. The left paraspinal line created by air in the medial left lung abutting posterior mediastinum near the spine. And the lateral margin of the descending thoracic aorta too. If you can use the rich texture of the cardiomediastinal shadowgram to your advantage, you might be able to catch disorders in the mediastinum that don't create a contour bulge, contour disruption, marked mediastinal widening, and even without a prior chest x-ray, because you'll notice that some of the textures in the cardiomediastinal shadowgram may be obscured in an area. Or that a structure, say the trachea, for example, looks like it's being pushed away by something. And on occasion, you just might see something that looks out of place. When it comes to assessing the mediastinum, the things you're trying to spot aren't just these, but all of these. Let's look at a few chest x-rays. Which of these supine patients do you think has a ruptured type A aortic dissection? Here's patient A's chest CT, which shows a ruptured type A aortic dissection. Looking back at these two chest x-rays, the mediastinum seems a bit widened in both, though maybe it's even more widened in the patient with the unfolded aorta than in the patient with the ruptured dissection. It seems there's a bit of a focal bulge along the upper left mediastinal margin, but this could be a subtle call. The strongest sign of something sinister was, in this case, actually a prior chest x-ray the patient had, which revealed how the left mediastinal margin had suddenly changed. 
This is a patient with small cell lung carcinoma, and here's his chest x-ray. Can you spot all the imaging signs of a mediastinal problem? Perhaps you spotted the focal bulge and the marked thickening of the right paratracheal stripe. But did you also spot how the lateral margin of the descending thoracic aorta disappears superiorly past the purple arrow? Can you spot the mediastinal abnormality in this patient? This patient's mediastinum is not widened and the contours are normal. But take a look at these interfaces. These are the patient's right and left paraspinal lines and they're laterally displaced because of a posterior mediastinal hematoma that occurred after a nasty vertebral body fracture. Before we leave the mediastinum, let's take a look at the one item on this list that seemed to cause the most anxiety back when I was a resident about to start call. Mediastinal widening. Mediastinal widening is a subjective call on chest x-ray. If you're looking for an objective definition, you'll have a tough time finding a definitive one. There's no consensus on where to measure it, though aortic knob seems to be most popular, but this can be tricky if the aortic knob can't be distinguished on your chest x-ray. And thresholds vary a lot. On portable chest x-rays, I'll just sometimes compare it to the mediastinal width um, to, say, the right lung width in a pinch. Mediastinal widening can be seen in a number of life-threatening conditions. But the vast majority of the time, the cause is something way more mundane, like an unfolded thoracic aorta, portable imaging technique, poor inspiratory effort, patient slouching, or patient rotation. And it turns out that it's really tough to tell the mundane cases apart from the concerning ones. Just look at the evidence. While mediastinal widening has been widely promoted as a useful criterion for detecting aortic injury, a lot of research has shown that its sensitivity for predicting aortic injury is not acceptable and that interreader variability is substantial. When using mediastinal widening to predict mediastinal vascular injury, the authors of a recent study found that the ROC curves generated by their radiologists resembled a statistically random process. When using mediastinal widening to predict acute non-traumatic aortic dissection, multiple studies show that the sensitivity of a supine chest x-ray is somewhere in the 60 to 80% range. Said another way, if we're using a supine chest x-ray to screen for acute aortic dissection, we'd miss one of every three. So come to terms with the fact that mediastinal widening is a pretty nonspecific and not particularly sensitive imaging finding on chest x-ray, and be familiar with what the evidence in the literature looks like so that you can set your expectations and the expectations of referring providers appropriately. CT imaging, or even ultrasound, are more superior studies if someone is suspecting an acute vascular issue in the mediastinum. Missing pneumoperitoneum is the next important diagnostic error to avoid when reading chest x-rays on call. CT imaging and left lateral decubitus abdominal x-rays have the highest reported sensitivity for pneumoperitoneum approaching 100% while the reported sensitivity of supine abdominal x-rays for pneumoperitoneum fall in the 50 to 80% range, which is similar to what's been reported for upright chest x-rays. There isn't a lot of data published on the sensitivity of supine chest x-rays for pneumoperitoneum. Although one group reported a sensitivity of 79%, that seems a bit higher than what most chest radiologists would expect. If the conventional wisdom amongst radiologists is that supine chest x-rays are not as sensitive for pneumoperitoneum as upright chest x-rays, you'd estimate that the sensitivity of supine chest x-rays for pneumoperitoneum could actually be somewhere in the 30 to 60% range. Most cases of pneumoperitoneum will encounter when reading chest x-rays, particularly supine chest x-rays, 
don't tend to present with classic features like Wrigler sign, subphrenic error under the right hemidiaphragm, or continuous di um, diaphragm sign. In fact, the majority of pneumoperitoneum cases on supine chest x-rays actually appear to present with right upper quadrant signs of pneumoperitoneum. And three we encounter frequently in chest radiology are the hyperlucent liver sign, leaping dolphin sign, and hepatic edge sign. Let's look at a few chest x-rays. Which of these supine patients has a pneumoperitoneum? It's patient A. Notice how the right upper quadrant appears hyperlucent, unlike in patient B. This is caused by free air anterior to the liver, causing what's called a hyperlucent liver sign. Also, notice how a diaphragmatic muscle slip creates a lucency lateral to it that sort of looks like a leaping dolphin. And finally, notice the cupola sign outlined with red arrows that represents air under the central tendon of the diaphragm. Make sure you're comfortable spotting the hyperlucent liver sign, leaping dolphin sign, and hepatic edge sign, since pneumoperitoneum on a supine chest x-ray you're reading on call is probably more likely to actually declare itself as one of these three signs rather than one of the more classic ones like Wrigler sign or subphrenic air. And finally, confusing normal variants and artifacts with pathology. In patients with moderate or severe pectus excavatum, the anterior rib cage compresses the heart and mediastinum and can often result in an apparently enlarged or unusually shaped cardiac silhouette that's displaced leftwards. In addition to an apparent medial lower right lung opacity, you don't want to confuse for a right middle lobe consolidation. Which of these patients has a pneumothorax? Or do both? Or neither? Patient A has a left pneumothorax, while patient B does not. Skin folds occur when a patient is supine and often created as the technologist shimmies the image detector or film cassette under the patient for their portable chest x-ray. Skin folds can usually be distinguished from a pneumothorax on careful inspection since there's often a paper edge thin line at the edge of a pneumothorax corresponding to the visceral pleura, while with a skin fold, there's just a sudden interface between two areas of slightly different density. Also, the one centimeter of lung immediately medial to the curvilinear interface of a pneumothorax will usually be of uniform density while with skin folds, there usually is a gradient. With some skin folds, you may be lucky enough to notice that the interface actually courses past the ribcage too. Also, skin folds that mimic a pneumothorax are uncommon in an upright PA chest x-ray. So in those cases, I'll tend to strongly favor a pneumothorax if what I'm reading is an upright PA chest x-ray. Which of these nodular opacities is a nipple shadow and which is a true lung nodule? It turns out that the nodular opacities in patients A and B were nipple shadows, while the one in patient C was a nodule. It turns out that nipple shadows, skin nodules, warts, and lung nodules are really tough to distinguish when they occur in the lateral lower chest. While bilateral symmetry favors nipple shadows, a round shape, partially circumscribed margins and size don't offer enough specificity. So have a low threshold for a repeat chest x-ray with nipple markers if you can't find a remote chest x-ray to compare to to prove that the opacity has been unchanged for a long time. Be familiar with all the external artifacts that are commonly mistaken for lung nodules too, such as buttons, ventilator tube connectors, and calluses from old rib fractures. Finally, what diagnosis do you think these two patients have? Patient A has 
pneumomediastinum and subcutaneous emphysema, while patient B has here extensions overlying their chest. You should usually be able to tell these patients apart by looking for linear radiolucent streaks seen outlining the central airways and cardiomediastinal silhouette in a pneumomediastinum case. And if you're in doubt, don't hesitate to ask for a reshoot and to call the patient's nurse to ask if there's a possibility they may have long hair or hair extensions. On call, you'll inevitably be confronted from time to time with a really unusual looking mass, the looks of which you've never encountered before on rotation or in your reading. Never forget to consider you might just be looking at your patient's hair.